Mark Bowden is the author of 13 books on diverse subjects in media, uh, world events, politics, and even sports. Uh, his books have included the number one New York Times bestseller, Black Hawk Town, uh, Killing Pablo, The Hunt for the World's Greatest Outlaw, and Guests, Guests of the Ayatollah, and best, The Best Game Ever, Giants vs. Colts, 1958, and The Birth of the Modern NFL. He's reported at the Philadelphia Inquirer for 20 years, and now he writes for The Atlantic, Vanity Fair, and other magazines. He's also the writer in residence at the University of Delaware. His newest book is Hue, 1968, a turning, turning point of the American War in Vietnam, about one of the bloodiest and longest battles of the Vietnam War occurring nearly 50 years ago. The Wall Street Journal calls it an extraordinary feat of journalism. Professor Greg Dadis is the, um, will be the moderator uh, today, uh, interviewing uh, Mr. Bowden. He is the, the Associate Professor of History and, a direct, and Director of Chapman's MA program in Warren Society. He served as the Chief of the American History Division in the Department of History at the United States Military Academy at West Point, and he's a retired uh, Army Colonel uh, who has served in both Operation Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom. He is, the, he is a specialist in the Vietnam War and the Cold War era, and he's the author of um, numerous books about um, military affairs in Vietnam, including his newest, which will be released uh, next week, and that is called Withdrawal, Withdrawal Reassessing America's Final Years in Vietnam. Uh, together with uh, Professor Dadis and the Warren Society program at Chapman, uh, the foundation is supporting scholarships for military and for foreign service officer professionals uh, for a year in their master's uh, in Warren Society program. Um, the goal is to have their thesis uh, completed using primary materials from the Nixon archive in an area of Nixon's grand strategy, thus enriching them with the knowledge uh, about President Nixon and that era when they go back into the field um, and, and back into their careers. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Greg Dadis and our author today, Mark Bowden. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you all coming this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's certainly a special treat for me uh, personally to, uh, um, to be asked to do this and in part because uh, I've been a fan of Mark's work uh, since I was a captain in the army when uh, Black Hawk Down came out, so um, this is a special treat for me. Um, so we'll get right into it. Um, Mark, I'd, I'd really think the best place to start is by asking you to tell the audience a little bit about uh, who Gene Roberts was and why he was so important to you writing this book. Oh, great. Uh, Gene Roberts uh, hired me at the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1979 and was, I think by most estimates, one of the great newspaper editors in American history. During the years that I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer, the paper won, I think, 17 Pulitzer Prizes in 18 years, which is kind of an unmatched record. Uh, I knew him as a fantastic editor, someone who um, not just encouraged me, but actually enlarged my ambition as a reporter and a writer. So I h held him in a very high regard, and I, and I knew, you know, that in a, somewhere in his deep past, Gene had been a good reporter too, but I didn't know much about it. And uh, I ran into him actually uh, when I was just beginning to work on this book. And he asked me, "Hey, Mark, you know, what are you working on?" And I said, "Well, I'm, I'm going to write a book about the Battle of Hue." And he said, "I was there," <laughs> and which I did not know. And so I went down to Bath, North Carolina, where he lives, and spent two days interviewing him. And it turns out that Gene was, as the New York Times reporter, actually bureau chief in Vietnam, he was the first reporter on the scene after the city was taken by the enemy. And he wrote the, the first stories out of Hue explaining what was going on there. And he had wonderful stories about the um, the whole experience. So he was the, my initiation into uh, writing this book, and because of his relationship with me, and as, as important as he was to me um, in my career, 
And as you see, if you read the book, he plays a very important role in the, in the story. I, I dedicated the book to Gene. So the Vietnam War uh, clearly remains a, a hotly contested event in our nation's history, and I think uh, most of us would agree in this room here today that historians and the, the populace at large still wrestle with basic questions about whether or not uh, the American war in Vietnam was... Sure. Uh, whether or not the uh, American war in Vietnam was unwinnable, whether or not it was a moral war, whether or not the United States achieved peace with honor, so as you set out on your own study of this, uh, what most concerned you about entering into this historical minefield? Well, I, I wasn't really worried about it so much because I didn't intend to um, try to present myself or the book as an, an expert on the Vietnam War as a whole. Well, the thing that I think I can do well is choose a particular episode and really learn what happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I was more interested in finding out what I would learn about this particular battle and this incident. And I do think it's true that as you learn more about what happened here, uh, in far more detail, I think, than most other stories about okay. con combat in Vietnam, all of the issues of the war in Vietnam come into play. Everything from military tactics to the political situation to the command decisions that are being made in Washington to the experience of uh, Americans and Vietnamese in the course of the battle. And I think it, it wasn't so much that I felt it was my goal or, or purpose to uh, weigh in on the great debate of the war in Vietnam so much as it was to really explore uh, what actually happened in this one particular episode, and that's you know what I've tried to do. That's great. You actually open the book with a, a young 18-year-old Vietnamese girl uh, who you say knew nothing about the global clash of ideas that brought Americans to Vietnam. Um, does this tell us something larger about the American experience in Vietnam? I hope it does. Uh, I think anyone who reads the book certainly better appreciates the experience of young Americans who were drafted or who, were enli who enlisted and fought in the war. And it also, I think really for the first time, gives you portraits of a number of uh, Vietnamese who were both, some of them are civilians who were caught up in this horrible battle. Some were, uh, as Che Thi Mung, the girl that you just mentioned, was a village girl who had joined the Viet Cong um, and some were seasoned um, NVA. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, to me, if you understand the people and you understand their motivations and why they're doing what they're doing, uh, it really gives you insight into the larger issues, why things happen. The, you know, Che, I mentioned that she knew nothing about the larger issues that got the United States involved in the war why the United States was there, other than they were a foreign power invading her country. Um, but in the same way, 18-year-old American Marines uh, you know, had no idea about Vietnam. And they didn't know anything about the people, the culture, the history. Most of them probably couldn't have found Vietnam on a map. Right. And, you know, and, and, and beyond that, they probably had a better sense, because they grew up in the United States, of the global issues of communism versus the Western world, I would think probably most young Americans had a better understanding of that than they had of the actual place where they were sent to fight and die. And even if you listen to the, the uh, ongoing Ken Burns documentary right now, Tim O'Brien, who serves a year after the Battle of Way, says that uh, <coughs> Americans were suffering certain deaths for uncertain objectives. So there is this sense that even a year after this battle, that Americans are still grappling with the larger political objectives. Yeah, and I think in that sense, uh, ever since uh, really uh, World War II, when the United States has intervened somewhere militarily, it's for r a relatively abstract reason. Right, right. Uh, it, it's, it's the kind of war where you have to sort of explain why it's important for us you know, to be fighting in this war. Mm -hmm. And those are tough wars to sell. Uh, you know, I think if you're fighting to defend your border from an invader, people don't need to have explained to them uh, why it's important to, to, to give their all. But when it's a war in a distant country 
cr across the world that you really know nothing about. Uh, it's tough, I think, to sustain public support for those kinds of military engagements in a democratic society, you know, where everybody kind of gets to weigh in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think what's heartening uh, with this book, and, and I think a lot of uh, Vietnamese uh, history and Vietnam War history lately is that you're starting to see more Vietnamese voices in the story, and I think that's incredibly important to achieve a sense of balance. And, so what surprised you most as you heard from uh, the Vietnamese about their own experiences as you were conducting your oral history interviews? Well, one of the things that really struck me, and I got this from talking to these uh, Vietnamese participants, was they were startled and a little bewildered by my interest in one battle in, in what they call the American War, the resistance war against America when many of these soldiers who I've talked to, even Che Ti Mung, who, mm -hmm. who started fighting for the Viet Cong when she was 18, uh, went on you know, to fight in her career against the Chinese and the Cambodians, and the older uh, soldiers had fought against the French and had fought against the Japanese. So for them, the American War is, is one chapter in a much bigger story, and that I would come to them interested in one particular moment in one chapter that it was kind of hard for them to, uh, to understand. And that gave me um, a certain insight into uh, their motivations in, in this fight. Uh, I, I was also struck by the um, immediacy of their commitment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was nothing abstract about Che T. Mung's fighting for the Viet Cong. Her grandfather had fought for the Viet Minh against the French, mm -hmm. and her father had fought with the Viet Minh. Her older sister had joined the Viet Cong and been killed mm -hmm. in combat. Uh, she had been arrested when she was 16 years old mm -hmm. after her sister was killed and was interrogated and waterboarded uh, by South Vietnamese troops who were trying to get her to name people in her village who were allied with the Viet Cong. And when I met her, uh, she's probably, I guess Che is about 70 now. Mm -hmm. uh, she's an ophthalmologist in Hue. Uh, she's still fiercely proud of not having given up any information in that interrogation. So uh, I think, you know, for someone like Che, there was nothing abstract about the war in Vietnam. It was her family's cause and her family's struggle. Mm -hmm. and, and that was true of a number of the, uh, well, I'll just mention one other fellow, Nguyen Van Quang who was a student in, in Hue, and he, he had actually not taken sides in the war in his own country. He saw the, the war, this is in the uh, early 1960s when he was in school, as a civil war between Hanoi and Saigon, and he had no strong alliance with either side. And in fact, the uh, recruiters at, on the college campus who were trying to get young Vietnamese to sign up with the Viet Cong would say, um, you know, this is a war against a foreign invader. And right. he didn't see any foreign invaders. I mean, to him, uh, it just seemed like a civil war. But when America entered the war in 1965, and he began seeing American troops in his city and American tanks rolling across the bridge, he felt, yeah, absolutely, this is proof. This is a foreign occupation of my country, and that's when he went to join the, the Viet Cong. So, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's story is different, right. but each of those stories gives you um, a sense of what, the, how the Vietnamese were viewing what was going on. Yeah, that's great. Uh, much of the book obviously relies on, on oral testimony. Um, was there a difference in your approach in terms of interviewing Americans compared to the Vietnamese? No, um, I, a, a lo greater level of difficulty mm -hmm. uh, because I don't speak any Vietnamese. So uh, I would sit there, the first time I went was in 2015 and I probably did 30 interviews while I was there that trip. And I would sit and listen, I'd ask a question and I'd listen for you know, 20, a 20 minute long answer and then my translator would give me a 30 second summary <laughs> of what the person said. And you know, I, I'm trying to, ask follow-up questions, and I knew that until I got home and had these interviews transcribed and translated that I 
wouldn't really know, you know what. And, and for me, and you know, Greg, because you've read the book, that um, uh, the kind of storytelling that I do absolutely relies on detail. Right. I want to know what you were wearing that day, you know. And so those kinds of details, obviously, I wasn't getting in talking to people. So when I got home and began getting these interviews translated and transcribed, I started realizing what the stories they were telling me. And the great thing is I was able to go back the next year, and in those cases where I really was, I found a story compelling, it was only then on the second trip that I was able to ask the kind of follow-up, the right. nitpicky follow-up yeah. questions that I like to ask. And again, I had no idea what they were saying in response uh, until I got back home and started reading the interviews. That's funny. Um, what about on the opposite side? What, what trends emerge from interviewing American veterans? Um, and um, to you, how did they remember their war in general and more specifically their experience in way? I would say that the American veterans who I interviewed were, number one, for the most part, enormously proud of their service. And, uh, and many of them proud despite the fact that they were troubled by it or felt later betrayed by the way that they were perceived when they came back mm -hmm. from fighting. Um, some of them felt betrayed by the political decisions that were made, but they talked very openly and in great detail about their own experience in the battle. And um, clearly the experience had been very hard for them, uh, traumatic. Uh, a lot of them spoke quite movingly of the, the losses of people who they really loved and admired, uh, the difficulty of losing someone and not even being able to stop and Right. And, and put your hand on them. I mean, you, you had to keep moving all the time. And, and so that um, inability to grieve, I found, was really striking. Uh, so every individual, though, is different, has a different take on what happened. Uh, and one of the curious things, which has nothing to do with the experience of the war, is just that I'm roughly the same age as a lot of these guys who I'm interviewing. I'm 66, and so I was a sophomore in high school, and some of these guys who were over there fighting in the Battle of Way were 18, 19 years old, so they're two or three years older than me. So I can identify. We, we talked about replace, hip replacements and, and <laughs> knee replacements. And, but what was really interesting to me is the, um, the variety of uh, uh, ability to remember. Uh, some veterans really did not any longer have detailed memories of things. Um, and it wasn't because they were suffering Alzheimer's or anything. It's just that some people don't, I think, retain um, those memories in that way. Or, but others could talk to you about what happened, what is almost 50 years ago, as if it would, had happened to them yesterday. Mm -hmm. And clearly, for someone like me, the people who retain that le level of memory became the most valuable uh, people to interview. So I found that kind of an interesting survey of how we remember. Well, it's interesting. I, uh, um, for those of you that may not yet have had a chance to read the book, I mean, if you think about the fact that one infantry company, is, as Mark brings up, lost a third of its men. Another started with 147 men, and after two days had suffered 123 wounded and 17 killed. And so in one sense, you're, you're really asking these veterans to remember some of the wor worst weeks of their lives. And, and Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, a fierce pride in having survived it and, and also a pride in their comrades who didn't make it. Mm -hmm. You know, because if I heard it once, I heard it 500 times. You know, the real hero mm -hmm. was the guy who didn't get to come home. And um, very, very moving stories. You know, here's something else is that I found, you might find this interesting is that often you, know, you, you interview someone and they're wonderful storytellers. Uh, they have a, like a prepackaged story uh, about something. And I was always suspicious of those stories. Uh, the, the ones that I like best were the people who I had to kind of elicit you know, uh, the details of, of what happened. And it was an unpracticed delivery of a memory. And I learned to trust those accounts more than the then the guy who'll have a couple beers and tell you, you know, the great stories about, about what happened in the war. <laughs> right. 
Um, there clearly is a lot of dying in this book, uh, burns, amputations, um, sucking chest wounds, and it's, it's near constant almost the entire book. And from that sense, I, I think personally, it was a difficult book to read and I imagine to write as well. So as an author, how did you deal with this onslaught of horror that you were working your way through during the writing process? Well, I think I made an effort um, not to be gratuitous about it, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that you can't write a story authentically about battle without writing about wounding and, and death. Um, it my, wasn't my desire to sugarcoat anything that happened. Uh, and and I, I have to say that I've been working as a reporter and a writer for a long time, right. and you become somewhat dispassionate about it as, as powerful, and you, you recognize what's a powerful story or a powerful moment in a story but without it necessarily touching me emotionally. I, I would equate it to a surgeon who right. is, is very used to seeing the insides of human bodies, has learned not to recoil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would say that I'm probably um, somewhat hardened by yeah. all of the, um, I'm judging material by how important I think it is, how much it informs my understanding of what happened and also uh, my sense of how um, powerful uh, that moment is in the, in the story that I'm mm -hmm. telling. As Jonathan mentioned when he introduced you, this is uh, your second major book focusing on the soldier experience in urban warfare, uh, mm -hmm. the first being Black Hawk Down, which is excellent. Um, given what you see, uh, or what some see as, as global trends in urbanization, what perspective has this exploration in way, as well as what you've done in Black Hawk Down, given you on the utility of military force in the modern age? Well, it certainly showed me how steep a learning curve um, our military has had. Uh, and it's true that as more and more of the world lives in an urban environment, it's only natural that when war comes, it's being fought increasingly in urban areas. In the case of Hui, it was such an unfamiliar terrain mm -hmm. uh, for the men who were thrown into this battle that um, it was terrifying for them because s everything was different. In the field, you almost always had a sense of where you were being attacked from and where the enemy was. And you, if you couldn't see the flashes of the rifles, you could orient by sound. Uh, or even just the, the layout of the terrain would give you important information. The city, which is close in all around, mm -hmm. and which you go around every corner and it's, it essentially looks the same, where sound ricochets off of every surface. So when someone started shooting at you, it was terrifying because you didn't know where it was coming from. Um, learning how, and I love the story in this book of Ernie Cheatham mm -hmm. you know, doing his homework uh, before coming into Hue, uh, how to assault a fortified position mm -hmm. Uh, without getting all your men killed. Um, these are things that had to be learned by trial and error, I would hope. And I, it certainly was true in uh, Mogadishu that the troops that went in on that raid were far more schooled in how to fight uh, effectively in an urban environment, although Mogadishu was not like Quay. Mogadishu right. was, if you've ever seen pictures of it or been there, uh, it's, it's very low and it's very widely laid out, so it wasn't quite the sort of intense urban mm -hmm. terrain that Hue presented. And I would, I've never looked into the Battle of Fallujah, you know, one of the major battles fought in Iraq, but I presume that a lot of the things learned in Hue and learned in, uh, in Mogadishu were, were utilized in, in that action, and that would actually be kind of an interesting thing to yeah. study and write about. And Greg, you should do All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> did veterans t talk to you about this, this the, uh, especially from the enemy perspective, that the enemy is acting clearly differently than what they've seen, that that, that, that experience of uh, all of a sudden being taken from uh, outside of an urban environment, thrown into a city, that, that, it, that this, this experience is really jarring for them and it takes them a while to kind of Yeah, it was jarring in every conceivable way. I mean, there were a lot of these guys who didn't even know there were cities in Vietnam. Right, right, right. I mean, they had spent months fighting, some of them, in the country, and they were just, you know, slogging through rice paddies and jungles and up and down hills, and all of a sudden, you know, other than flying into a big airport, you know, they 
had no idea that there were these big cities with big buildings and, and uh, um, taxi cabs and, and gas stations and all that stuff. So that, that was a big surprise. And another thing that was shocking to a lot of them was that they had spent a lot of time trying to find the enemy. Right. Uh, in the field, you know, they would be attacked and ambushed and then they would go looking and they often would not find the people who had attacked them. So that was kind of the pattern that they found. Here, suddenly, they could see enemy right in front of them in large numbers and they were fighting, standing and fighting. They weren't running away. And uh, so on the one hand, it was in a one way almost satisfying you know, that you finally had a fight where you could see who you were fighting and you could fight back. But on the other hand, as I said, it was uh, also really terrifying. And I think the estimation of the uh, dedication and ability of the uh, enemy went way up. Yeah. Um, and it was funny, when I, I think I wrote in the end of the book, General Westmoreland made some comment about how the enemy had been very ineffective and and boy, I didn't find a single person who fought in Hue who said that they weren't fighting against a very skilled, very tenacious enemy. Right. You mentioned early in the book that war was, and I presume still is, uh, stitched deep in the idea of manhood. Um, why is it you think that we still look on, on the horrors of war like that in Hue uh, as central to Americans' conceptions of masculinity? Well, that's a really good question, Greg. Um, you know, and that's, uh, you need an anthropologist to answer that <laughs> one. Um, you know, I do think that the idea of masculinity f in our culture has always emphasized um, a toughness of protection, of mm -hmm. protecting people who need to be protected, women, children, that it, it was the man's responsibility to go to war, mm -hmm. um, to fight, and I grew up you know, certainly in that culture. My father was in the Navy in World War II. My, a couple of my uncles were in the Marines. I had an uncle who fought his way across Europe in World War II uh, in the Army. And um, I grew up with the expectation that at some point in my life I would go to war. Mm -hmm. uh, because that just seemed to be what happened right. if you were male. And, uh, and also, you know, with television and movies of World War II, Korea, were big, big parts of my childhood. In fact, my dad, escaped being drafted into Korea because I was born. Uh, they, he, they were taking men with two children and I was the third. And so the, I, my mother always said, you save your dad from having to go to Korea. <laughs> but when you grow up like that, you, you, know, you recognize that, well, I'm, I'm gonna grow up to be a man, so what's my war gonna be? And it, it sort of looms, looms over you. And then, of course, the war that came along, in my case, a little too early for me to be involved with was uh, was Vietnam. By the time I got to be draft age, they were we were pulling out mm -hmm. instead of drafting and sending people. So I I missed that. But uh, and I I I felt in interviewing the men who fought here that like me, you know, they either enlisted or readily consented to be drafted because they felt that was her, their responsibility, not mm -hmm. just as a citizen, but also as a man. Right, right. And it's interesting that, uh, uh, one of the things I found interesting in the book is that you say that those who lived, who died, made no sense. Even the smartest, most salty guys got hit. So that it complicates that narrative a bit, doesn't it? It definitely does, and I think that's one of the horrifying aspects of combat. Uh, I think that in any enterprise in your life, if you, prepare yourself and, and, and do the right things and uh, uh, try and apply what you've been taught, that you have expectations that you'll succeed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that is true. I mean, I think on average, uh, probably if you're a skilled soldier, you have a much better chance of surviving. But in a battle like this, death and wounding is, appears to be completely random. Right. And uh, so that the knucklehead uh, next to you, who you think is not going to last for 10 minutes in combat, comes out and survives. And the gunny sergeant, who you look up to and admire as the best soldier you've ever met in your life, gets shot down and killed. Uh, so there's no rhyme or reason to it. And it's, that's very disturbing yeah. when you realize there's, there's very little you can do to in, increase your chances of being successful and, and of surviving, I think it's frankly one of the most terrifying aspects. 
did you find similarities between in that aspect between Way and, and Black Hawk Down, or was there some something different there because this was more of a no? An that was exactly the same. I mean, I think that was a, a universal sentiment of the young men who fought in Mogadishu mm -hmm. and, and also the veterans who fought. I think that's like an essential part of combat. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, if we could just momentarily lift our sights a bit, um, do you feel political leaders like uh, President Johnson were also beholden in a sense to this idea of, of masculinity that this fear that losing in Vietnam would illustrate their own inadequacies, inadequacies not only as a person but then if we extrapolate that out to as a nation. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. I mean, you heard um, President Johnson and President Nixon talk about they would, did not want to be president um, to preside over the first loss uh, of an American war. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think there was a great deal of concern about the blow that would be to the prestige of the United States. But beyond that, just to the um, importance of America's commitment. I mean, as a country having made a commitment to a cause to fail or to abandon a cause would have lasting um, um, adverse consequences in the, in the way that the United States was respected. And it's one of the, the central world. pillars of debate today still. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think also tied up in that. But a, a downside of that is, is also, you know, Vietnam was a war that I think it's fair to say at this point could not be resolved by a greater um, application of force. Right. Um, even though that was an instinct that a lot of people had, like people were always advocating uh, hawks during World War during Vietnam wanted to bomb more in North Vietnam. They wanted to level Hanoi. <clears throat> and if you read uh, the comments of the Navy aviators who were flying these missions over uh, the North Vietnam, there were no targets. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it didn't make any difference. I mean, you're risking your life, and believe me, they had very sophisticated anti-aircraft, and we lost a lot of pilots and planes, but you're risking your life to bomb a wooden bridge that three days later would be reconstructed and running again. And, you, and then you're getting you know, political pressure to bomb more, and there's a passage in the book where one of the commanders before the Senate, I guess one of the Senate committees is being asked, well, uh, what's the problem? Why can't we, we bomb more? And he says, targets, right. targets. We don't have targets. I mean, we, the, the, the old adage, we want to bomb them back to the Stone Age? Yeah. Well, this is a society that wasn't all that removed right. from the Stone Age to begin with. So how did you go about then balancing the, the micro level, the, the street by street fighting in way um, with this macro level at, the, at the, the White House level and even at the MACD level in terms of larger grant strategy and foreign policy? Well, I, I kind of realized early on, <clears throat> one way to tell a complicated story is to find um, representative characters. So if you can, movies do this all the time. If you have like three or four or five characters who you can really focus your whole story on, you can sort of use them as a narrative thread that you can follow through the entire story. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me very early on that I was not able to do that with Huey because there were so many characters involved. Right. Um, when John Hersey wrote his book Hiroshima, this classic book about the explosion of the atom bomb over Hiroshima, he wrote it through six characters. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, I mean, that ep episode happened to everyone in the city of Hiroshima at the same time. All of them had different experiences, but they all experienced the same event, which was the explosion of the bomb, at the same time at different places around the city. A battle like this, which took place over a month, you know, every individual's experience was so completely different. And each individual experience is only a very small piece of the larger story. So, and frankly, you know, many of the people who I interviewed got carried off of this battlefield, yeah. if not most. Uh, and that you'd find a wonderful storyteller who would begin giving you his, his memory of the Battle of Hue, and I, you're thinking, well, this is great. You know, this guy's a terrific interview. And then it ends. Well, then I got hit, and I was gone, and that's the end of my battle. So it becomes, by definition, kind of a tag team um, narrative. So what I did was I realized that the, the narrative thread for this story had to be the battle itself. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to understand from overhead 
what is the overarching structure of this event and why you know, was it unfolding the way that it was unfolding. And when you get up to that level, you're dealing with high-level command decisions. Right. And, and then you know, by virtue of the fact that the, uh, uh, they were using audio tapes in the White House, when I went to the Lyndon Johnson Library in Austin, you know, they, uh, you know, they have wonderful detailed daily records from the National Security Council at the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. They have this wonderful uh, repository of all the audio recordings. So I was focused very narrowly. I wanted to know what was going on during that month. Right. And so I could listen to President Johnson's conversations over the course of that month. So it's, it's for, as a storyteller, if you can, you know, draw this connection between Washington, D.C., what's going on here, and what's going on, you know, inside the Citadel, uh, you know, from some 18-year-old Marine, uh, that enables you to tell a very sweeping story, but yeah. you can't lose sight of that overarching narrative. Yeah, that's great. Um, do stories like this better help us uh, as Americans understand the cost of military interventions overseas? Absolutely. In fact, you know, that was actually more in my mind when I wrote Black Hawk Down, mm -hmm. because the period between the end of the war in Vietnam and the episode that I wrote about in Mogadishu was one where, blessedly, the United States was not at war, other than the Persian Gulf War, which appeared to be over in about a day and a half. Um, there wasn't a lot of intense combat uh, experienced. To my knowledge, you know, perhaps there were in special ops missions and things, but for general consumption, we were not at war all that often. And I think the rapid success of the Persian Gulf War had also kind of lulled Americans into the notion that our military was so superior, uh, so sophisticated, that we could go to war without our guys getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And I think, frankly, that we lost 18 men in the Battle of Mogadishu. That was such a shock. I mean, it, it, General um, uh, Colin Powell said one time that if he lost 18 men in a mission in Vietnam, it wouldn't have even warranted a press release. Right. And yet here in, in Somalia, 18 men were killed, and that was such a shock. And I think part of the reason for that shock was that Americans were so accustomed to thinking that our military was invulnerable. Right. And I think when you appreciate the human cost of using military force, it ought to make you very careful yeah, yeah. about when and where you choose to, uh, to do it. This is interesting, because you, <coughs> you quote Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who's assessing the Tet Offensive as a public, public relations problem, not a military one. So wh what does this tell us about how war more generally is communicated to the American public? Well, number one, it tells you how little McNamara understood about what was going on in Vietnam at that time, in my opinion. Uh, because it's very definitely a major military a blow to, to the United States. And even though General Westmoreland continued to characterize the Tet Offensive as sort of um, abortive, small-scale military uh, engagements in the cities in Saigon and other cities, he never fully grasped, I think, the significance and scale of the Battle of Hue. Uh, he never acknowledged until like 20 years later that the city had, had actually been taken by the enemy. He was saying within days after the city of Hue was taken that there were only f 500 enemy troops in the city. These were in cables to the Joint Chiefs and to the White House, not just statements to the press. So I think what you know, McNamara, when he, when he said that, uh, was working on the assumption that there was no real significant accomplishment by the enemy, that it had all been the press and the sort of exaggerate, exaggerated reports of violence that had sort of blown the Tet Offensive up to be something much bigger than it actually was. And I would argue that it actually was a major, you know, um, an effective military thrust, albeit only for a short period of time. Right. But it was a powerful challenge to the Arvin forces and to the United States, and it was a complete surprise, probably one of the most successful surprise actions you know, in our history, uh, that they managed to amass an army of 10,000 outside of the city of Way without tripping any alarms, right, you know? right. and then were able to take the third largest city in the country without 
really engaging in any significant fight. And it wasn't really until the counterattack came that this terrible battle was fought. So I think, you know, McNamara didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> what conclusions did you draw about the role of reporters in Vietnam, having uh, written this book? Well, you know, I, uh, obviously I'm a reporter myself, so my, you would expect my bias would skew toward journalism. But I, you know, part of that upbringing, at least where I learned to be a reporter, was to try to put aside, uh, you know, what I might be inclined to think. Uh, I honestly did not know. I didn't know that Gene Roberts had reported from right. Hue. Um, I didn't know until I actually went and looked, you know, what was being written about this battle when it was happening. Um, and, but I was very well aware that many people felt, and per perhaps still feel today, that the United States would have won the war in Vietnam if the press hadn't torpedoed the efforts by you know, turning so negative about what was going on. And there is some truth to that. But my examination of this one episode involved figuring out, number one, what was actually happening. And then number two, looking at all of the reports mm -hmm. that were being written by the few journalists who actually made it there. And what I learned about this episode was striking to me. At the same time that the um, military commanders in Vietnam and the White House were, I won't say lying because I think they were genuinely misunderstanding, but they were delivering misinformation about what was happening. I mentioned what General Westmoreland was saying that there were maybe only about 500 enemy troops in Hue. There were 10,000 enemy troops in Hue. Mm -hmm. If you go back and read the reports that Gene wrote in the first days, he reported that the city had been taken by the enemy, that there were only two small outposts in the city, one American, one South Vietnamese army, who were surrounded, and that the Marines at the outpost where he was reporting couldn't get more than a block out, out of their uh, compound. So the stories that they were writing were the truth. And they were getting their stories by being there and by talking to the young officers who were trying to fight here. And so these were, in my eyes, very valid reports. So it was kind of striking to me that the true stories were being delivered by journalists, not by public information office in Saigon, not mm -hmm. by General Westmoreland, not by General LaHue or, or General Cushman. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my, what I take from that is the value of having an independent press. Uh, you know, people say, and I can only really speak with authority about this episode, but people who want to believe that journalists uh, lost the war for us, there's some truth to that. If what they were doing was telling the American people the truth, and if the truth itself alarmed people and turned them against the war and made them distrust you know, the information they were being fed from official sources, uh, it's true. Reporters helped uh, lose the war. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, Walter Cronkite, obviously highly respected uh, journalist at the time, um, felt that Tet as a whole, as it's unfolding, uh, really forces him to abandon neutrality. Um, so do you get a sense that, that the overall offensive really is, uh, you mentioned obviously Way is a turning point, but that the Tet offensive as a whole is a turning point in how not just Americans, but also journalists themselves as professionals are reconceptualizing the role of the media well, I think that one of the lessons that the military learned from the war in Vietnam is it's not a good idea to let reporters go wherever they want in the battlefield. <laughs> um, uh, you know, basically in Vietnam, if you were a reporter and you could get military transport, you could go wherever you wanted to go, and you would be talking to a, a Marine captain uh, leading a company out somewhere in the field who would tell a reporter, you know, the tactics that we're, being, that we're using here are not working. Mm -hmm. And that same reporter would go to Saigon and get a briefing saying how wonderfully the tactics were working. Well, who's he going to believe, you know? And, and so that, I think, the military learned not to do that, for better or for worse. Um, Unless the embedded reporters, which is... Yeah, well, we've embedded reporters, and I, and I was actually very pleased to see that, because uh, today, in modern combat, very often 
the field of battle is very far removed. Uh, unless you can get the military to cooperate in getting you there, and they develop mechanisms to do that, which mm -hmm. is which is good. But um, I think that, to be honest, you know, I I've been in the newspaper. I was in the newspaper business for like 30 years, and I've been writing books for the last 20 years or so. And and um, the journalists that I know and respect haven't changed. You know, they were interested in understanding what was really happening. Right. And they were in Vietnam, and they are still today. And I think it's an invaluable part of our democratic society that we are free to do that, even if we are sometimes labeled enemies of the American people. Yeah. Uh, let me finish up with one question, then we'll turn it over to you, the audience. Um, if there's one major perspective to be gained from studying the American war in Vietnam after having written this book, what do you think that is? Um, you know, I think that, and I don't present myself as an expert on the war in Vietnam. I, um, I am, I would say I probably am an expert on this one battle. Um, but I would say overall, my sense of the war in Vietnam was that the, things that got us into this war were grounded in a very simplistic understanding of Vietnam and of Southeast Asia. I think that our national political debate and our national political priorities had sketched out a view of the world where the communist monolith was spreading. I remember seeing these cartoons as a child, you know, the black ink of communism spreading everywhere. The red ink. The, uh, the red, well, I had a black and white TV. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that we, it was our responsibility as defenders of freedom to stop this spreading ink blot. And the truth is that what was going on in Vietnam was far more complicated than that. Uh, Vietnam was a country with its own rich history and culture. And if you read a book that I very much admire, David Halberstam's uh, Best and the Brightest, you see how the, because of the fear of communism that dominated our politics through the 1950s and early 1960s, regional experts, and this is why we have a State Department, this is why we have a CIA, uh, people who have lived in that part of the world, who understand the culture, the history, who spoke the language, were systematically booted out. Because if you stood up in a meeting in Kennedy's White House talking about Vietnam and said, wait a minute, this is not really just a battle or a war about communism. It's actually more complicated than that. You would be escorted out as being soft on communism. And so we dumbed ourselves down, I think, as a country. And as a result, we found ourselves in a war that we couldn't win because it was, we didn't understand what was going on there. Uh, we didn't understand the feelings of the Vietnamese people, many of whom were just trying to stay alive and yet, and were alienated by the very tactics that we employed to protect them and defend them. The old classic, it was necessary to destroy the village in, or, in order to save it. Well, the villagers didn't feel real good about that. Um, so I think that that is true often in American history. You know, the present administration hasn't even staffed the highest levels of the State Department. Uh, there's a, a, a kind of a alarming disregard right. for the very carefully cultivated expertise that we've developed as a country. And to me, that's kind of alarming. And I think it leads us to do things stupidly around the world. So that's a lesson. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Jonathan, I think we can uh, turn it over to Thank you, Greg. Uh, Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mark will answer your questions, but before he does, I just wanted to announce that he'll be available to sign copies of Huey 1968, and they're also available for purchase in the museum store. I'd like to start off by asking, we've been involved in Iraq and Afghanistan since, uh, since 2000, or Afghanistan and Iraq from 2001 and 2003, respectively. Do, do those military engagements at all, in your mind, um, resemble what, is, what happened in Hue and the overall of the Vietnam War? 
They do in a way. I mean, I definitely think our military is far more sophisticated and professional uh, than it was in Vietnam. But I think that uh, we clearly saw that toppling Saddam Hussein created a far more complex and difficult situation than we anticipated. Uh, again, a failure to understand the complexity of the environment that we were you know, stepping powerfully into. Um, and today, we still have troops you know, fighting in, the, in what is a very confusing landscape in that part of the world, which now engages Syria as well as uh, um, what used to be Iraq. Um, and of course, in Afghanistan, uh, I think you had once more um, an overestimation of what the military can accomplish. Our military is really good at killing people and blowing things up, and it needs to be. And that's an important tool. But it's a very blunt instrument. And I think Afghanistan continues to bedevil our uh, military leaders and our political leaders. Uh, we can't get out uh, and we can't stay in. And that, what does that remind you of? We have a question in the back row. Um, I would like to have the people that were in Vietnam to stand up so I can see in this room how many people came home from Vietnam. Please stand up. Thank you. I think Jonathan is going to. Thank you. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, Thank you. Uh, Bruce Clark wrote a book called Case On, which uh, he's over the years uh, tried to get it into a movie. Uh, I, I'm hoping your book is better. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, you know, for us, for us who were there and lived with it and saw what was going on, and the lies we were told by the politicians, uh, and the reactions that we received from our commanding officers um, was beyond anything we've ever understood. And now, with this Ken Clark, Ken Burns thing that he just done on, doing on television, he's almost made the war, war a joke. Uh, that, it was, that we really didn't, we were, we were there and we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, we were there because we were fighting for the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And I, as a physician, was working to keep people alive. Mm. And, I, and when I see books like this, I'm really looking forward because I want someone to really tell the story of what happened. I'm, mm -hmm. I congratulate you doing it on the book. Well, thank you. And that's my goal. I mean, I, I want to better understand what happened in Hue on the, in that month. And the story that I've written is built on the accounts of as many people as I could find who were there, including physicians who were trying to save lives in, in the middle of this battle. So uh, I think it's valuable to, 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 to dig deeply like this, to capture what it was actually like for those who were serving. And I asked everyone, you know, why were you there? What did you think you were fighting for? And they thought they were fighting for their country and for a very important cause. We have a question right here. I just did. I'll admit I haven't read your book yet, but um, Weren't there quite a few civilians massacred by the VC? Yes. When you were talking to the VC, did you ask them about all those killings? Every one. Okay. The reason I ask also <laughs> is because when I got there four years later, we were told right away, you fight for your life because the VC will give you no quarter. Mm. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing, and I'm sure, you know, my father went twice. You know, by the time I got there, I had maybe an advantage to that. But, you know, I, we learned those things, too, and particularly from the VC. They would use kids, mm -hmm. you know, women. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter. So that's what I was wondering. Well, I think uh, in any war, uh, you have people who are fighting who have a conscience and who have standards. And I think it's true of many Americans who fought in Vietnam lacked, most of them had high standards, but there were plenty who didn't. And I, you'll see if you read this book, there are you know, Marines who will talk about shooting people whether they were certain they were enemy or not, or uh, of people they knew who uh, 
uh, who raped or who, who looted. Uh, this, these kinds of things are part of battle. Because I mean, you, if you're a company captain in the Marines, you'd say you have 200 men under your command. You can be the best captain in the world and, it, and enforce the standards that you think are appropriate. You don't shoot people willy-nilly. You, if you take a prisoner, you treat them humanely. Um, you, all the things that you would expect come from a command. I guarantee you that among your 200 Marines, there are going to be some who don't follow the rules and who get angry because their buddy just got killed and who, and who act out. And th that happens in every war on every side. You know, and there were clearly instances where, and I write about them in the book, where the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong very cruelly uh, behaved very cruelly and very unconscionably. But you also had people who were taken prisoner and marched off and held, we know there were prisoners of war held for years. And, and some of them in relatively humane conditions, most of them in terrible conditions. But you know, I, I think that what you're talking about is the nature of, of war. And I would hesitate to just make the assumption that one side is vastly superior morally uh, to the other. And mm -hmm. uh, the people that you talk to in Vietnam, uh, how do they feel about the, uh, the system of government that they have now? You know, we thought it was going to be uh, uh, totalitarian and, uh, and all the concentration camps and the re-education camps they have and the, uh, the lack of political freedom. And now juxtapose that with them wanting to uh, ally with the United States to keep China from uh, controlling the Pacific Ocean, uh, which is one of the reasons why we were there in Vietnam, because mm -hmm. we thought that the communists, if they took over, that whole area of Southeast Asia would then control the Pacific Ocean. Hmm. Well, it's a, it's a hard question to answer because obviously, you know, I had a fairly limited sample of people who I interviewed. I would say, number one, the Vietnamese who I met are enormously proud of having achieved independence, particularly hmm. those who fought in those wars. Uh, they, many of them are true believers in their one party system. Uh, you know, I would discuss with them, well, how can you call it an election if there's only one uh, candidate, you know, <laughs> running? And they said, well, the, you know, the party has the interests of the people at heart. So there is that. And, and just as, you know, there are many Americans who don't give their system of government a thought, who don't even understand how their government works, but they're very loyal uh, to the United States. Uh, it, it, that's about how deep it runs with them. Others are... Chafe, they chafe under the authoritarian nature of the regime in Hanoi. I found it, even interviewing them about things that happened 50 years ago, some were very nervous about speaking candidly about things like the executions that took place when that, that's a great embarrassment to the uh, government of Hanoi, which likes to characterize the, the Vietnam War as a war against Americans, not as a civil war. So the idea that their troops assassinated their fellow countrymen when they took over Hue is an embarrassment and a shameful episode. Nevertheless, I found people who talked about it uh, bravely and who condemned it, and even who in some instances took personal responsibility for their involvement in it and were ashamed of what had happened. So I think what I see in Vietnam is an authoritarian state. There's no question that the Vietnamese people lost something very precious when the United States left and Hanoi reunified the country. Uh, but by the same token, um, many, if not most of them, perceive that war as a war for independence and are enormously proud uh, that they were successful. It's interesting that now my young translator from Ho Chi Minh City, Xuyen Dean, she's about 21 years old, I asked her how her generation feels about the American war. And she says, um, well, we look at South Korea and Japan and wonder if Vietnam would be like that if we hadn't kicked the Americans out. Mm -hmm. So it's an evolving uh, awareness of the importance of that war in their history. The one thing that has happened is that the party has relaxed its controls over the economy, as much as we've seen happening in China. 
And so there's a tremendous amount of free enterprise in mm -hmm. Vietnam, a tremendous amount of bustling growth. Mm -hmm. People are excited about their opportunities for the future. They're excited about their relationship with the United States. They welcome Americans. I, I mean, people were excited mm -hmm. that Americans you know, were visiting. There appears to be no hard feelings in Vietnam for the million Vietnamese who were killed in that conflict. It's really kind of astonishing. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the front row. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ronnie Geyer. I'm a veteran of the first major battles of the Vietnam War. And when I came home, when I wanted to tell him what it was all about, the movie We Were Soldiers, Mel Gibson, as Hal Moore, my commanding officer, I was in that battle. Oh. No one wanted to hear it. I've already seen everything on TV to know about Vietnam. Right. So now we have the narrative that we're having today. This is why I'm here, because of the last week and a half of Ken Burns' television series. Right. Not because I'm in it or I have a picture or two in it, which I do, but it gives the narrative. And I came here because of the issue on Way itself to get your read on those executions. I had always heard that when the communists took over, that they sent out notices to all of the leaders of the city, the civil leaders, the teachers, the clergy, please assemble at the uh, uh, assemble in the city square uh, for a meeting. And right. that's I always heard that it was like 1,100. <coughs> of, heard that it was 1,100 of them, uh, and then they were not talked to. They were led to a ditch, and they were they were all slaughtered which was found, and we saw how it was found on Ken Burns this week. Yeah. But Ken Burns also said it was 2,850, not 1,100. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I've also heard that this spurred on the Arvin troops who were fighting like mad in the citadel there in Way. They went on seeing what would happen when the communists took over Way to people in being slaughtered, how that spurred the Arvin who were slovenly fighting the war up till that time, fought like crazy. Mm -hmm. And that the only thing that stopped us from winning that war later on was our cutting off our funding for them to fight for their freedom with in 1975. Mm -hmm. And that was led in Congress by Ted Kennedy after Watergate. Right. Well, I don't know that I agree entirely with that narrative, but I can talk about the purges in Way. The reason for the disparity in the numbers is that it's very, very difficult in, the, in a month-long battle where probably 10,000 civilians were killed. Uh, it was necessary to bury people in mass graves anyway. So it, when they began finding mass graves were of people who had been bound and executed, Douglas Pike, who was a, you I'm sure know who Doug Pike is, was a US information officer in Vietnam, made a study, which is probably the most authoritative um, study of, of the executions themselves. And he unearthed, or he studied at mass grave sites and he counted 2,000, roughly 2,800 uh, executed. The, the official Hanoi count, and they acknowledge that there were executions, is 300. So, I mean, you, you, know, you get, yeah. choose your poison. You know, I think without question, everyone I interviewed who was living in Hue at the time remembered th these executions. And as you said, people were rounded up and they were supposedly being sent to re-education camps. Most of them never returned. Some of them were executed on the spot. And in fact, I have in, in my book a list that the North Vietnamese troops had as they came in the city, very, very detailed lists of the names of the targets for rounding up and executing. They called them, these are people who owed a blood debt. But now you have to understand, this is the Civil War. And so to the, the North Vietnamese and to the Viet Cong, the people who worked for the Saigon government or who were allied with the Saigon government were traitors. And this was war. You know, and so in, in war, you know, traitors are executed. Very often that's the case. There's no question that that very ruthless practice turned a lot of the people of Hue against the communist forces. And they left that city they entered the city thinking they were going to instigate an uprising where the people would rise up and su support them. And I think without question, they left the city having created many more enemies uh, than they had before they entered it. It's part of a very complicated story, but it's you know, one that I try to tell uh, to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. We have a question right here. In, uh, in Mac Mirror's memoir, uh, I thought he expressed a huge amount of remorse as a kind of almost a broken leader, uh, appreciating how wrong-headed his direction had been. But 
nonetheless coming to the conclusion that he couldn't convince Johnson not to go forward and escalate. So granted that history is the means for learning prospective lessons, I'm curious how we might differentiate the Korean situation where we have an ego-driven leader who appears to be motivated to have an ego satisfaction without regard to the lack of winnability. Just curious if there's any lessons you see that you could stitch together between the Vietnam political lesson and the current circumstance. Well, I've written about the North Korea situation for the Atlantic where I look at what our actual military options are. Mm -hmm. And as you say, uh, you know, virtually any combat that takes place, whether we target Kim Jong-un himself or whether we try to crush uh, their military capability completely, leads to, uh, a, in, a, in high probability, the deaths of literally millions of people. Uh, many of them in Seoul who are within artillery range of massive North Korean batteries. So, I mean, any attack on North Korea is going to have potentially unthinkable consequences. We're talking about potentially the worst catastrophe in human history, yeah. the numbers of people who would be killed. So the idea that our president is exchanging insults uh, by tweet with this, you know, young tyrant in uh, Pyongyang is embarrassing to me as an American, but also really alarming when I consider the potential for loss of life and, and harm. So that said, I don't think that, that, that this current situation compares really with McNamara's. McNamara's story is a really interesting one, and I think a very important one. He is one of the architects of the war in Vietnam, he was, for those of you who are familiar with Robert McNamara, the president of Ford Motor Company, and an expert on quantified analysis of, of basically um, it making more efficient a, an industrial enterprise by using data. And so his approach to the war in Vietnam was drew on his background as an industrial leader, and he tried to quantify you know, the, the war in Vietnam, the whole idea of body counts that you're going to win the war by killing more of them than they kill of us uh, was, I think, grows right out of you know, McNamara's whole philosophy. But the interesting thing about McNamara was his own data and his own theory of fighting the war began to break down and he saw it. And by the 1966-67, he had concluded that we could not win the war in Vietnam. He began to tell President Johnson what he thought, and much like I described earlier, if you stood up and talked about the complexity of the situation, you were considered to be soft on communism, and out you went. Well, of course, Johnson began characterizing McNamara as soft on the war, and eventually moved him out uh, and named him president of the World Bank. But here's the moral dilemma that Robert McNamara faced. He knew more about the war and how the war was going, ostensibly, than just about anyone. And he understood that it was not going well. I would think that as a leader, um, understanding that you're talking about tens of thousands of lives, you know, that you would have a moral obligation, even if you couldn't convince President Johnson, that you would speak out. You would say to the American people, look, I'm responsible for creating this war, and I'm telling you, it's not working. You know, this is, we, we are not winning this war with these tactics, with the way we're doing it. He chose not to. He didn't speak out about how he felt until how many years later? Until another 30,000 Americans were killed, another half million. So to me, that was a, and I think McNamara realized it himself, a deep moral failing. I think he had a, an obligation to speak his mind and chose not to. And I think probably for, his own decent reasons. He was trying to be loyal uh, to President Johnson. He didn't want to betray uh, the people. Or maybe it was because he really wanted that job at the World Bank. You know, <laughs> I don't know. But whatever the reasons were, they don't stack up in my mind to the consequences of having held his peace for so long. We have time for one more question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bowden, thank you for writing uh, your book. It's very, very affecting. I must say, uh, along those lines, you know, the surviving Marines whom you interviewed, 
PTSD comes to mind. I mean, how would you assess their mental, psychic state? I would say most are fine. Most came home from the war and got on with their lives. And as I said, most that I interviewed are proud of their service, however they feel about the way the war played out, however they feel about the way they were used. They are, um, they consider themselves to be better citizens and better off for having been through the experience. Many said I would do it again. You know, I would go fight again. Um, some are very, very troubled by their experience in the war. Uh, and have, you know, many of the men who I interviewed have been through years of counseling or still struggle with things that they saw, things that they did, how they feel about what they were asked to do. Um, I don't think it's most, but I think it's a sizable number. Uh, and I think that's true of, of war. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there are people who go through these terrible experiences and, they're, and they can process it. And they can make sense of it in their mind and they get on with their lives. And some people struggle. And I think that's just being human. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Greg. Please give both gentlemen a round of applause. Again, Mark will be available um, in the lobby to sign copies of Huey 1968, and books are available for purchase in the museum store. Thank you very much for coming.